Ladies and uh, gentlemen, welcome you all on this very special evening and a special welcome to our guest, Professor Peter Singer. My name is Marcel Becker. I'm working at the Center for Ethics and Teaching Applied Ethics at this university. And the Center for Ethics organizes, together with the Suterbeek program, this evening with Peter Singer, currently Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University. The evening has a very clear program. Peter Singer will give a lecture. It will take about one hour. Immediately after the lecture, I will ask several questions, and then you will have the occasion to ask him questions. And 10 o'clock, the evening will be finished. In introducing Peter Singer, I would like to start with a quote. In 1972, a young, deeply engaged philosopher wrote in the renowned Journal of Philosophy and Public Affairs, he wrote, start quote, the whole day we look at moral issues needs to be altered, and with it the way of life that has become taken for granted in our society. So the young students wrote, young men wrote in 1972. Past 40 years, this philosopher contributed to the change he indeed contributed to the change of our moral landscape. Time magazine described his as one, as one of the most influential people of the world, of one of the most hundred influential people of the world. And he is called, for instance, the father of the animal rights movement. On the other hand, still many things have to change, I suppose. We will more about it from him soon. I now first give the floor, not to Peter Singer, but to other singers.
Well, I don't know what to say after that uh, introduction. I've had many introductions uh, in my day, but that is something completely new. And uh, thank you so much for uh, the song, but not only for the performance, but obviously for the composition. Um, I'm, I'm really flattered. I don't know whether the lecture is going to now be an anti-climax um, after that, but I will, I will do my best to uh, live up to it. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Marcel, for the uh, introduction, and I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. Uh, but first, of course, I do want to talk uh, about this topic, uh, which is a rather large topic, as you can imagine. Um, so this lecture is going to have to move fairly quickly over a number of different questions, which uh, I am sure some of you would like to have some more detail and more discussion. But fortunately, we will have time for that discussion. Uh, um, we will have a question and answer between myself and uh, Professor Becker, and then uh, we will have a chance for you to ask questions as well. So if I do go too quickly, just note down the question that you want to ask, and hopefully you'll get a chance to do that. Okay, so I'm beginning, since I assume that some of you don't really know much about ethics, that you're not all, you haven't all studied philosophy, I'm beginning with some uh, assumptions about the way in which I approach ethical issues, and um, I'm going to, again, have to be a question. So these three questions are all uh, are yes, that is, yes, we can reason about these and other ethical issues, and that's what we're here to do tonight. We're not just here to express our feelings or emotions, but actually to reflect and think about these issues. Um, yes, I believe, though I'm somewhat more hesitant about this, that we, there actually are objective truths in ethics, that some things are right and some things are wrong. And therefore, um, I answer the third question, subjective. Uh, some aspects of it may seem that way, but really there are underlying truths which go beyond particular cultures or individual subjects. So that's the assumption on which I, or a set of assumptions on which I ground the discussion. And if you say, well, what is ethics? Um, this actually slide uses the word morality, but I don't draw any real distinction between ethics and morality. So, say the same here. So, it's a, a definition I borrowed from uh, the philosopher James Rachels, which you can see here. It is, at the very least, the effort to guide one's conduct by reason, that is, to do what there are the best reasons for doing, while, and this is an important qualification, while giving equal weight to the interests of each individual who will be affected by what one does. <coughs> So that's the way in which I want to go about doing ethics. And I am a utilitarian, that difficult word to pronounce. Um, so uh, this is a short account of what utilitarianism is. It's the view that an action is right if its consequences are better than, or at least as good as, the consequences of any other action that the agent could have done. So the utilitarian says you should always do what will have the best consequences out of whatever choices you have open to you. So it's a, an ethic that judges things by their outcomes or their results, not by whether they are in conformity with certain moral rules, nor whether they embody certain virtues, nor even whether they respect particular rights. Although utilitarians can talk about rights um, as a useful institution, uh, but ultimately whether we respect rights is going to depend on the consequences of doing so for all those affected by the actions. And if you ask what consequences do I mean, what am I talking about when I talk about actions that have the best consequences? Um, I'm referring to whatever it is we value for its own sake, 
that's consequentialism, broadly speaking, there's different views here, and we seek to maximize whatever it is we value for its own sake. And utilitarianism, which is a version of consequentialism, says that we must be universally, we must talk, think about these goods universally, not just for ourselves. That would be egoism, but consistently with the definition from James Rachel's, we should be thinking about what's good for everyone affected by our actions, not just for ourselves. And uh, among utilitarians, there's a distinction between two forms of utilitarianism. I mean, there are more possibilities too, but I'll mention only these two main forms. The classical view of the great 19th century thinkers of the British utilitarian tradition, Bentham, Mill and Sidgwick, is hedonistic utilitarianism. We are concerned to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Or, another way of putting it, we want the greatest possible net surplus of pleasure over pain. So that if you deduct pains from any action, the, the pains that will be caused by any actions you, you might do from the pleasure that they will give rise to, it's the greatest possible net surplus. Um, so pleasure and pain are the goods there. And another version which has developed more in the 20th century is known as preference utilitarianism, which holds that what's good is that the preferences of sentient beings should be satisfied to the greatest extent possible. These views have a lot of overlap because, of course, sentient beings have preferences to avoid pain and to experience pleasure. So there's a lot of overlap, but they're not completely identical. But for most of our discussion, it won't matter too much which of these views you might hold. Now, there's one, uh, there are many objections to utilitarianism, but there's one I thought that I would put up on the screen um, that uh, maybe will be familiar to some of you and I think will clear the ground a little bit if I mention it and uh, uh, respond to it. So this is a famous passage from Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, uh, where Ivan puts this question to Alyosha, um, about asking him, you know, it's, it's one of these philosophical examples that philosophers still always do, you imagine this situation as a kind of thought experiment to test the theory. So, uh, as you can see, it's not only academic philosophers who do this, 19th century Russian novelists do it as well. Um, so, uh, Ivan asks Alyosha, imagine you could create uh, the fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving them peace and rest at last, but it's essential and inevitable to torture this one tiny child, that child baby beating its fist over there, for instance. Uh, would you found that evidence, that edifice, on its unavenged tears? Would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me and tell me the truth. And Alyosha says, no, I wouldn't. Well, I'm sorry, the utilitarian says, yes, I would. The utilitarian doesn't agree with Dostoevsky. Um, and the utilitarian will point out that in this example, there is one child who has to be tortured to death, tragically. And of course, that's a bad thing. But if we don't do this, in this example, the world continues as before. And we know how the world was in the 19th century. Unfortunately, we know how the world still is today. There are many babies who are tortured to death. Sometimes deliberately tortured to death by, uh, say, in, in, in uh, wars in which um, uh, troops uh, attack and kill civilians. Uh, sometimes by sadistic or violent parents even. Sometimes by people in drunken rages. And even of those that are not tortured to death, millions more will die slowly from starvation or illnesses that could be prevented because of their poverty. I'll talk about that more later. So essentially the utilitarian will say, you're asking me to choose between torturing one child and allowing the 
torture and the suffering of millions of children for decades, for centuries to come. So that choice is not so difficult for a utilitarian. Of course, it's emotionally difficult. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it would be emotionally actually impossible for me to torture a child to death. In a way, I kind of almost hope that it would be, that I'm not the kind of person who could do this. But if you ask me, should I do it? Would it be right to do it? Indeed, do I have an obligation to do it? And you imagine that this story is really true. Hard to imagine because Dostoevsky doesn't tell us exactly why you have to torture this one child to death in order to create this utopia on earth, but we're supposed to imagine that you can. So in that situation, I would think that's what I ought to do. And that's the answer that you give to that is an important way of distinguishing a utilitarian way of thinking or a consequentialist way of thinking from uh, a deontological way of thinking. That is a view that says there are certain moral rules that you must never break or human beings have certain rights that you must never violate. Uh, the utilitarian will say if you're sufficiently certain that you'll create a much greater good uh, um, by doing this, then it would be right to do it. There, in that sense, there are no absolute rules, which doesn't mean, as I said before, that morality is subjective. It's, it's according to the classical utilitarians, anyway, the people I'm talking about, it's objectively true that this is the right thing to do. But there are no moral absolutes in the other sense that says there are no things that it's wrong to do, no matter what the circumstances that you might find yourself in. Okay, so let's move on to some of the ethical issues that we're talking about. So I'm going to start talking about animals, uh, one of the things that I'm known for. I do think of this as one of the great moral wrongs that we're doing, still in the 21st century, and something that we ought to change. And we are making some progress in this issue. In fact, this slide here, uh, not sure how familiar you are with this system, this shows a system of keeping the pregnant sows, the breeding sows that produce the pigs that are then sent to market that people eat, in what are called gestation stalls. And this has been a standard way of keeping uh, sows in intensive farms, in factory farms, for several decades now. Already when I wrote Animal Liberation in 1975, this was the standard way of keeping pregnant sows in intensive farms. But the good news is that, at least in the European Union, that leading light of civilization in this area, from January the 1st next year, this will be permitted only for four weeks. Now, I think four weeks is too long for to keep animals, pigs like this. But currently, these pigs are like this for their entire pregnancy. Um, which is, uh, I think, about 13 weeks, if I remember rightly. Um, and then, after being with their piglets for a short time, they are made pregnant again and put back in their stalls. So, uh, the stalls will be substantially less used, and because they can only be used for four weeks and you then have to house the sows somewhere else, my hope is that most pig producers will not use them at all. Because why have them if you only can use them for four weeks? So. The European Union has made some good progress with this, and, and even in the United States, which lagged behind Europe in most respects of, of farm animal welfare, now at least some states and also some big producers are saying they will get rid of this. Even McDonald's has said that I think over a 10-year period they will eliminate uh, suppliers who use this method of keeping sounds. So. Progress is being made, but there's a lot more progress to make. But let's look at the, some of the ethical questions and the philosophical issues. And I, I'm, I'm using a couple of examples to show why I think utilitarianism makes such an important difference as compared with some other philosophical views. So here's Aristotle, going back a long time, of course, to the ancient Greeks. He doesn't really think that uh, animals matter in themselves because they exist for the sake of human beings. Essentially, he sees the world with the less rational existing to serve the more rational, and so plants for the sake of animals, the brute beasts for the sake of man, um, and incidentally, the less rational humans, that is, the barbarians, uh, for the sake of the more rational humans, that is, the Greeks. 
Um, so Aristotle defended slavery in much the same way as he defends the uh, use of animals. Um, so nobody holds this view uh, really anymore, but um, it did enter Western philosophy through the thought of Thomas Aquinas, um, who brought Aristotle's philosophy into the Christian tradition and blended it with the Christian scriptures as well. So uh, Aquinas has many reasons for saying that um, animals, that we have no moral duties to animals, one of them being that he accepts the uh, Aristotelian view, another being this, what he says here, that God has subjected all things to man's power. So he's referring to scripture here. He's referring to the grant of dominion over animals in uh, the first in, in Genesis, um, which doesn't have to be interpreted that way. Some rather kinder, gentler Christians nowadays uh, interpret it as something rather different from saying that it doesn't matter how we behave towards animals. But that's certainly the way Thomas uh, uh, interpreted it. And because he was such a dominant influence in the Christian tradition. I noticed in walking here that you have some uh, uh, things named after Thomas Aquinas at uh, this university as well. Um, and, you know, Thomas was certainly a remarkable thinker for his times, but his views on animals were simply dreadful. Um, I think there can be no two ways about that. He actually says, uh, this is not the only quote, um, that it doesn't matter what we do to them. There's, there's no sin in being cruel to animals. The only reason he advances for not being cruel to animals is that it, you might develop a cruel disposition and then you might be cruel to humans. And that would be bad. But just for being cruel to animals, it's not bad at all. And uh, even much later, uh, Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher of the uh, uh, end of the 18th century, um, has a somewhat similar view. Uh, he also says we have no direct duties to animals because animals are not self-conscious and therefore they're merely a means to an end. And that end, of course, is man. I suppose he probably meant humans, generally and generously interpreting. Um, but, um, uh, but you have to be self-conscious to really be an end in itself. Now, I think that actually this is one of the places where Kant simply made a pretty obvious mistake. He... It's true that to be a morally responsible agent, you have to be self-conscious. So, I don't think that we can really apply praise and blame to animals because they're not self-conscious, just as we can't apply it to infants because they're not self-conscious either. Um, and so they can't really reflect on what they ought to do and decide what they want to do. But there's no valid argument from saying that because they're not responsible moral agents, they're not ends. We might say that they're not, they're not moral agents, but they are moral patients. That is, there are things we can do to them that matter morally. And this Kant doesn't seem to have understood. Um, again, like Aquinas, he thinks that uh, the worry about people who are cruel to animals is that they will be cruel to humans. But he says, uh, we have no direct moral duties to animals. Now that's, as I say, not so long ago. That's uh, in the late 18th century. And that's around the time that Jeremy Bentham, the founder of the English Utilitarian School, was living. But Bentham took a very different view. Um, this passage is a footnote in uh, the Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, a work that he wrote shortly after the French Revolution. And he pointed out that um, the French had discovered that the colour of a person's skin is not a reason for denying him rights, because they had this Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and they annihilated the colonies. And Bentham, in a very forward-looking passage, says the day may come when we also recognise that the fact in various ways, he describes some of the ways in which they differ, is no reason for abandoning them to the whims of whoever wants to uh, torment them. Uh, and he says, in, I think, uh, 
perhaps thinking of, of uh, objections like Kant's, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And that's the utilitarian position, which I think is a great advance over the other positions that I've just outlined, and can serve as the foundation of a position about the ethics of how we ought to treat animals that still stands today. So this is the view that I would defend, which I think is, is just a development in a way of that little footnote of Bentham's. Um, I suggest the principle of equal consideration of interests, that if beings have interests in the sense of being able to feel pain or um, uh, experience pleasure, then we should not give those interests less consideration just because they're not members of our species. That's no different from really giving human beings less consideration because they're not members of our race. The kind of thing that Bentham noticed the French had realized. And so it's saying, well, if you accept that in the case of different races or people of different skin color, why wouldn't you accept also that species? It's just another biological grouping. It's not relevant to whether you have interests or it doesn't determine whether you have interests. And so we should not discriminate on the basis of species. That's it. So I use the term speciesism to make the point that there's a parallel between those other isms like racism or sexism that we reject, um, but many people <coughs> still accept speciesism. Now the second point I make here, the important word here is equal weight to similar interests irrespective of species. So what is true is that beings of different species will have different interests. And of course different humans will have different interests. Certainly adults have a completely different interest from small children. And so these interests are not always similar, not always the same. And particularly, I guess, with different species we may get different cognitive abilities and different interests that arise from that. So we have an interest in education. Um, animals don't because they can't benefit from it in the, the same way. But there are some interests that are similar. And I think uh, capacities to feel pain give rise to similar interests in not feeling pain or roughly comparable interests, not exactly the same. And the, the idea, therefore, of the principle of equal consideration is of giving equal weight to these similar interests. But, so that, I think, is the ethical basis on which we should um, deal with animals, which we should treat animals. And uh, this I've already said, we should therefore reject speciesism. And I guess I've already said this too, this is just an example of some cattle grazing on an uh, attractive um, organic farm near Princeton University in New Jersey. And um, their interests are probably quite well satisfied here. They have enough to eat. They have uh, space to roam around. They have uh, the calves are with the mothers, which uh, is not uh, the case in many farms and uh, not the case in, in dairy farms, but that their interest in staying together as a social unit is met. So their interests are met. But our interests, of course, would not be met by being kept in a field uh, in New Jersey. We would have lots of interests that we could not make. So we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that the view I'm defending means equal treatment. You have to treat beings in accordance with the different interests that they have. Um, but uh, we shouldn't be giving their similar interests less weight. Now, there is a question that could be raised about the killing of animals, uh, that is raised about the killing of animals, that I'm not going to say much about really for reasons of time, but I do want to point out that these are two different principles. So the first principle is really what I've argued for now, that pain and suffering are equally bad no matter what the species. And, but when we consider killing, you mainly, that is raising animals in good conditions and killing them uh, painlessly without uh, horrible uh, transport, long distances and things of that sort. Well, we might think that there are important differences between beings, not, not because of their species, um, but because of their awareness of their own existence over time and of their quality of life. 
their ability to think about their future, the extent to which they, they live their life on the basis of expectations that they will have a future. And at least, this is perhaps one of the points where the two forms of utilitarianism I put up on the slide before might come a bit apart, at least the, the form of utilitarianism that's based on satisfying preferences, uh, the killing of a being with a preference for continuing to live and for continuing to do the various things that that being has planned to do, the, per the killing of such a being without that being's consent will cause a greater loss, a greater harm to that being than killing a being that is not capable of existing in the future. Or sorry, not capable of understanding that it exists in the future. Um, so we could think that killing animals painlessly is not so bad, maybe that it's defensible um, in a way that uh, inflicting suffering on them where it only serves to benefit us, not as much as it costs them, is not just fine. But, of course, the conditions in which we keep animals is certainly not justifiable uh, on the view that I'm defending, because uh, this is something that the European Union has not yet outlawed and doesn't seem to be about to outlaw, um, an intensive chicken factory with, as you can see, tens of thousands of chickens all very crowded together in a big shed. Um, and uh, it's a miserable life for the chickens who are not adapted to this sort of existence. Um, uh, but it's done to produce chicken a little bit more cheaply so that people who like to eat chicken can do so. Well, I think the, the cost to the chickens uh, greatly outweighs the benefits to humans. Since we don't need to eat chicken for our uh, nourishment or health, um, so uh, there's no necessity for us to do this. And we're causing vast numbers of, of chickens to have miserable lives in order to produce that meat for us. So I've got some more slides here which I'm really just going to flash through uh, uh, briefly. Um, oh, sorry, I must have dropped them from the thing. Right, I don't have any uh, other slides. So um, I decided, I think, that I got uh, that it was getting too long. So, but you probably have already seen um, pictures of other uh, intensive. <laughs> Form, forms of intensive farming. So let me um, leave the question of, of utilitarianism and how we ought to treat animals uh, there, although some of the things I'll be saying later will also have some implications that are relevant to the eating of, of meat. But I, I will go on to talk about the question of global poverty. So again, this is um, another issue in which I think the way the world is currently organised is very different from the way a utilitarian would want to organize it. So, just to illustrate this, um, so what am I showing here? I'm showing a private uh, pleasure boat, or euphemistically called yacht. I used to think yachts were things that you sailed around in using the wind, but um, this is uh, what is known as a yacht, owned by a guy called Paul Allen. If you haven't heard of Paul Allen, he was somebody who got rather lucky in high school. He had a friend who was good with computers. He was good with computers too. Um, so they set up a little company to write software. His friend was called Bill Gates. The company became Microsoft. And Paul Allen became a billionaire. Um, he, he sold out of Microsoft um, uh, uh, some years ago, but still retained quite a lot of stock. Um, and one of the things that he did with his money was to um, have this built for his enjoyment to you know, get a party of friends together and travel around the world and, and go to nice places. So you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, it probably cost him around $200 million to build and uh, I've been told by people who know about the costs of uh, these sort of things, it probably cost him about $20 million a year to maintain. And this is in a world in which According to UNICEF, about uh, slightly over 8 million children under the age of 5 die from preventable poverty-related causes. So, um, what else could, be, could Paul Allen have done with his money, uh, rather than this yacht that he and his friends enjoy sailing around with? Well, it's, it's pretty obvious. 
Now, um, this is an example that um, uh, Marcel Becker quoted from an article I wrote a long, long time ago. Um, and uh, in the article, I used this example to get people to think about our obligations to people in need. So I asked people to imagine that they're out for a walk in the park or maybe just on this pleasant campus you have here. And somewhere there's a shallow pond, an ornamental pond. Uh, and as you walk past this pond, you see that there is a child who's fallen in the pond and is in danger of drowning. Um, and there's nobody else around as far as you can see. There's no parents or babysitter or anybody else looking after the child. You don't know why that, how that has happened. But uh, what you can see is that if you don't jump into the pond and save the child, you, uh, the child is quite likely to drown. But you're wearing some expensive shoes, unfortunately, your favourite, most expensive shoes, uh, and you don't have time to take them off, the child might drown while you, while you do that. So you're going to ruin them. Um, so there is going to be some cost to you. Uh, cost of maybe a couple of hundred euros or whatever an expensive pair of shoes is, it costs you. Um, is that a reason for saying that it's okay not to save the child? Well, most people will say, fortunately, no, that's not a reason to say that it's okay not to save the child. You can't weigh a child's life against the cost of a pair of shoes, no matter how expensive those shoes may be. So you ought to jump into the pond and you ought to rescue the child and you're doing something wrong if you don't do that. And you don't have to be a utilitarian to think that. Most people, fortunately, think that. There are many different ethical views which would have that consequence. And of course a utilitarian would also think that. But if that's so, then it suggests that we do have obligations to help people who are in need. And this is one way in which I would formalize the argument that I think lies behind the example of the child in the pond. <coughs> If, you can, if we can prevent something bad without sacrificing anything nearly as important, we ought to do it. So, the death of a child is bad, seriously bad. Um, we can save this child's life without sacrificing anything nearly as important. We're just sacrificing our shoes. There's no danger that we're going to drown ourselves because we know the pond is not so deep. So, um, the premise is we ought to do it. Now, I also think that this applies to the situation of global poverty. There are about over a billion people living in what the World Bank defines as extreme poverty. That's uh, the purchasing power equivalent of what in current currency might be uh, about one and a half euros per day, um, somewhere between one and a half and two euros per day. And that's the purchasing power equivalent. It's not it's not uh, what you get in another country when you exchange your euros, which is often a rather inflated rate that makes things in the country cheap. Um, it's what buys as much in the country where the person lives as uh, one and a half or two euros buys here in the Netherlands. So it's an amount that you really struggle to live on. And don't forget, these are people who have no government provided health care. Sometimes they have no government provided <coughs> schools. Uh, often they have no government provided uh, safe drinking water or sanitation. So those are all things they have to get to themselves. So this is a very bad state of uh, uh, life. And I believe we can prevent some of this extreme poverty anyway without sacrificing anything comparably important. So. For example, for the cost of a pair of expensive shoes, uh, you can certainly, through effective aid agencies, you can help people in significant ways. Um, let's look, I'll look at that in, in, in a moment. So if this is true, if this premise is true, then I think it follows that we ought to prevent at least some extreme poverty. We have an obligation to do it, just as we have an obligation to save the child at the pond and we would do wrong if we don't do it. And 
The point is that while uh, you know, we, we are not faced with this choice of the child in the pond, we do have money that we spend on things that we don't really need. So um, some of you at least uh, will buy things to drink. Maybe it's just bottled water, maybe it's uh, uh, other drinks. But you have the option of uh, drinking simply water out of the tap, which is safe to drink, which I assume this is. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, if you're fortunate in the Netherlands here, it's perfectly good. So if you do spend money on things that you enjoy drinking, it shows that you have money that is surplus to your real needs. <coughs> nice that you can do so. I don't want to say that nobody should ever do so, but it does suggest that you have money to spend on luxuries. And of course, for most of us, we have a lot more than that and spend a lot more on other things than that. So we have that, that luxury. And we can, as I say, <laughs> give it away to effective organisations. Now, some people often say at this point, well, how do I know which organisations are really going to do anything good with my money? Um, isn't it true that some of them waste it? Don't some of them just give it to governments uh, that are corrupt, where it doesn't get to the people who need it? Well, um, some aid is wasted. Any big human institution, things can go wrong from time to time, undoubtedly. But there are some organisations that are highly effective. This is a website of uh, GiveWell.org. Um, there is an, uh, an organisation in, in the United States that looks at charities helping the global poor and evaluates those that are demonstrably effective. And as you see, it recommends actually a very small percentage of those that examine. Now that doesn't mean that the others are demonstrably ineffective. <coughs> It simply means that it doesn't have, at least in many of these cases, it doesn't have enough evidence to really reach a burden. But obviously if you want to be <coughs> confident that your gifts will be going to the most effective organisations, you would give to those that can demonstrate their effectiveness. Um, that slide may not be as helpful for you in the Netherlands as, uh, as it is perhaps for uh, Americans or because uh, they're, they're, they're basically looking at American organisations, but um, it does give you an indication that we can actually assess organisations. We have other groups. We don't have to spend hundreds of hours examining them ourselves. We do have other organisations that are doing some of the work for us. So it's certainly worth looking at uh, this website, and it looks at lots of the hard questions about um, what is really effective and what is not. And uh, this is actually the, one of the organisations that GiveWell is recommending at the moment. Um, it's uh, one of uh, a number of organisations that is distributing insecticide treated bed nets in areas where uh, malaria is uh, rife and um, therefore protecting children from getting malaria. And uh, this can be obviously a life saving intervention. The $5 figure there, um, you can't read all the small type, the $5 figure is the cost of the net, but it's not the cost of saving a life. That's significantly higher um, for various reasons, including the fact that obviously not every net distributed saves a life. Not every child would otherwise have died, otherwise there'd be no people living in these areas at all. Um, but um, it is an effective organisation, and uh, uh, so it's one of the ways in which we can uh, save lives and uh, it's just one of many examples that I've, uh, that you could give where we can intervene. Some people will say, well, I don't just want to save lives, I want to lift people out of poverty. So there are other programs that will uh, help them with their agricultural practices or will provide education um, and help them that or to find other skills to avoid poverty. There's a lot of different strategies that can be used in order to uh, help people in extreme poverty. And these are things that we can do, as I say, that we have the ability to do. Uh, I'm not also saying that, uh, that this should be entirely an individual matter. We can also, uh, we can also um, advocate that our government should do more. You have, uh, by global standards, a reasonably good aid program in the Netherlands. Uh, you give about 0.8% uh, 
uh, of your gross national product to A, that is, in other words, about 80 cents in every 100 euros that the nation earns. It's better, much better than the United States, but it's still not terrific. I mean, uh, you could, uh, a nice round 1% would be a little bit better. There are some nations that give around that. I think the, some of the Scandinavian nations give around 1%. And, uh, you know, why not be the first nation to break the 1% barrier and give more? I, I think that would be good. But uh, as long as your government's not giving as much as you really think it should be giving, then we do have the option of making our own contribution, making a difference. And if we judge our actions, as I said, by the consequences of what they're doing, then we can do things which will, I think, quite clearly have good consequences, better consequences than if we simply spent the money on ourselves. So the problem seems to be, as I say here, that um, the question is that, well, where do you stop? Okay, so with a child in the pond, there was just one child in the pond, just one pair of your own expensive shoes to ruin, you save the child, you find the parents, give the child back, you say, okay, now I've got to buy another pair of shoes, but, but that's the end of it. It's not likely that twice in your life you're going to need to save a child who's fallen in a pond. But of course, in the case of the argument I'm giving you, you may give the 200 euros or whatever the shoes cost to one of these organisations, um, but perhaps you've saved one child's life, but um, there are lots more children, 8.1 million of them according to UNICEF, whose lives need to be saved. And since you're not Bill Gates, and perhaps not even if you were Bill Gates, can you save all of those lives? Um, so, the question is, where should you stop? Where is the boundary line? And this is a well-known objection to utilitarianism, that it seems to be a very demanding morality. It seems to say, you must always do what's best. It's not good enough to do what's just okay. You've got to always do what will have the best consequences. And now, in this kind of example, perhaps others, it seems like you have to kind of become some sort of moral saint in order to do what the utilitarian says. You have to just keep giving away until you've got nothing much more, really, to give away. Can that be right? Well, um, the utilitarian is concerned about the consequences of their actions, as I've said, and is also concerned about the consequences of what we advocate. So, in speaking to you, I'm undertaking an action. And I have to consider what will have the best consequences. And it's possible that actually advocating some lower public standard will have the best consequences. Because if I tell all of you that you should give everything away until you're on the verge of extreme poverty yourself, you're probably going to say, I went along to the university and I heard some nut who thinks that I should give everything away that I have. I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, so probably no one, or maybe, you know, there's one or two saintly people among you who might do that, but the results would not be as good as if I say, look, um, just do, try to do something significant. Start small if you like. Build up from there. And uh, do, do something that is actually making a, a real contribution, but don't feel that you have to live your life in... Uh, just uh, wearing rags and um, uh, eating stale bread and drinking water. Um, it's reasonable enough for people to say, um, I will do what I think I can do and that I will advocate uh, to others that they will do what will actually achieve the most good. So in that way, if more of you decide to do something significant, maybe the total amount of money that will be contributed to help the global poor will be greater than if only one or two of you did something quite extreme. So, this is in fact what I've suggested in a book that I write on this topic, The Life You Can Save, which uh, exists in Dutch as well, and also um, on a website that I've got, I suggest <laughs> standard something like, like this. Um, I'd better move along, but you can look at it. Uh, if you like, uh, if you look at this website here, thelifeyoucansave.com, uh, you'll see 
I put up a standard to suggest what people might give so that you can kind of feel at least you're, you're doing something to contribute to the problem. Okay, that's, that's the website if you want to look at it. And actually we asked people to pledge to meet this standard. And as you can see, uh, a few weeks ago we had about 13,000 people who pledged. It's nice that there's 13,000 people who pledged, but when you think about how many people there are who get onto the internet, uh, it would be nice to make that figure quite a lot bigger. So if you're interested in this, um, spread the word. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, the last of the three issues that I think uh, are the central crises of the 21st century, and this is the question of the changes that we're making to our planet. Um, I assume that since this is a university audience, since you know something about science, that you accept that the overwhelming scientific consensus is that human emissions of greenhouse gases are changing the climate of the planet. Um, so I'll just take that for granted for the moment rather than uh, uh, try to defend that evidence. And the question then is what ought we to be doing about that? So here's Paul Allen's yacht again. <laughs> it's a great example for me. Not only does it cost a lot of money which could be used to save a lot of children, it also uses a lot of diesel fuel. An amazing amount of diesel fuel. In fact, I, I went to the trouble of checking this out with somebody who knew about the engines that the yacht had, was involved in the marine diesel industry, and knew how much fuel it used. So here's a Volkswagen Jetta. So in one hour, running that yacht at full power, which no doubt Paul Allen does to get his friends to nice places, in one hour, <laughs> it uses as much fuel as would take this Jetta 140,000 kilometers, which you know is several years driving for, for most people. In the Netherlands, since you ride bikes, you probably will never get to that. <laughs> um, and in terms of nitrous oxide emissions, which is one of the uh, potent greenhouse gases, uh, it's even worse. So you really have to ask whether, uh, in some way, we, we allow a single individual to make such gross contributions to uh, climate change. Um, now, in fact, we've sort of... Uh, promised that we were going to do something about this. Twenty years ago, uh, all of the world's major nations and many of the not so major nations signed on to this declaration in Rio de Janeiro uh, saying that we would stabilize greenhouse gases at a low enough level to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So the government of the Netherlands signed on. Even surprisingly, President Ronald Reagan of the United States signed on, although the United States then never signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. But uh, Reagan, the conservative icon, agreed to this. Unfortunately, 20 years have now gone past. We've just had, as you know, the Rio plus 20 kind of anniversary summit, which seems to have been a huge waste of time, not to mention the amount of fossil fuel that was involved in flying all the people over to Rio again. Um, and uh, uh, we still have no agreement that is going to stabilize greenhouse gases at a low enough level to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with uh, the climate. In fact, probably we have already caused that. Uh, if not, we're very close to it. Um, uh, and we will soon get to that point where the uh, interference is not only noticeable, it's already noticeable, um, but that it is likely that the entire system will get out of control. It's likely that feedback loops will cut in. For example, the rise in temperature will thaw the permafrost in Siberia, which traps uh, significant quantities of methane, and that will be released, and that will cause further warming. So um, we have really not done anything nearly <coughs> enough to maintain uh, that pledge. And um, here's some more detail why this is. Um, so uh, we have already emitted uh, enough at current levels to probably be committed to a 2.4 degrees Celsius increase. Anyway, somewhere in that range that's, uh, that's listed up there. And uh, so though we don't know exactly when these feedback loops will cut in, it's probably somewhere in that range. 
Uh, already the planet has warmed a bit, but um, there's a latency curve because of the coolness of the Earth, and particularly of the oceans. So the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere are going to cause significantly more than the uh, 0.6 of a degree Celsius, which um, has already been realized as compared to the pre-industrial age. I'm sorry, I'll take questions after I've finished talking. Um, so, uh, that's the warming that we're committed to, I believe. Now the question is what we're going to do about this. So I think that what we need to do is reach an agreement, uh, and here's a suggestion for how we might do this. It's utilitarian only in the sense that it's a position that I think nations could understand to be fair and agree for that reason. So we work out how much greenhouse gases we can allow to be emitted, and uh, there's various bodies that have done that. For example, there's an institute at Potsdam in Germany that uh, uh, works out uh, that sort of suggestion. We divide it by the world's population, which gives you a per person, per capita share of what the total is. You give each country a greenhouse gas emissions quota equal to the country's population, multiplied by the per person share. And so every country has a quota. And if you did that, you would find that some countries are exceeding their quota and other countries are under their quota. Um, just as a way of indicating the disparity between the richest nations and the poorest nations, according to what the uh, German Institute I mentioned at, at Potsdam or the <coughs> Wissenschaftliches Beirat, uh, it's called, it's a German advisory council to the government, um, uh, it estimated how at current rates, how soon countries would exhaust their quota for emissions up to 2050. Okay, so if you try and calculate how much the Earth can absorb, not on an annual basis, but up to 20, the year 2050, the United States is going to use up that quota in only six years. It's so much in excess of its quota. So it's almost, it's, it's eight or nine times its per capita fair share on this, on this basis. Some of the world's poorest countries, uh, gives the example of the African nation of Burkina Faso, is not going to use, a current rate of emissions, is not going to use its quota 2050 until we get to something like 5,000, the year 5,000. In other words, it has almost 3,000 years, I think it has 2,800, they calculated, years at present rates of emissions before it will reach its quota. So what that indicates very clearly is that the richest nations are the ones that are using far more than their per capita share, and the poorest nations are the ones that are most under it. So in Europe, generally, you're, you're, you're using two or three times your, your per capita share, not the eight or nine times that the United States is using, but still significantly more. So you would still also have to buy quota from the poorer countries that are under their quotas. And that in itself would, would be a good thing, although we would have issues about who do we give it to in countries that have corrupt governments that are not going to use it for the benefit of their population. So there's a lot more questions to be asked. But I think in principle, this would give us a fair way of deciding what we ought to do to solve this problem. Now, I can say that as a philosopher putting forward a theory. I don't know how I'm going to persuade countries like the United States to comply with their obligations <coughs> under this, because at the moment there just doesn't seem to be the political will to do so, which is uh, a terrible tragedy, um, and is going to be, I think, one of the, therefore one of the, the great crises of the 21st century. And the cost of this, the worst thing about it, is going to be for the poorest nations. Now this relates, I'll just go through this very briefly, this relates to what I was saying before about the livestock industry, because it's one of the greatest contributors to climate change. This is a 2006 report from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, oh, sorry, the United Nations, which says that uh, livestock is, is a bigger share than transport. I think that that's actually a significant underestimate um, because of uh, the uh, amount, the, the contribution that methane makes and it, it relates to the time period you take it. So here's a much higher estimate, comes from two scientists writing for World Watch magazine uh, a couple of years ago. They think it's actually 
Over half of human greenhouse gases are caused from the livestock industry. Um, that report has been criticised. Some scientists think it's exaggerated. The truth may be somewhere between 18% and 50%. But it's very significant. And it's a reason why, even when we talk about some uh, organic farming, it's another reason why we should be reducing or eliminating our, our meat consumption. So when people think about uh, animals and livestock and climate change, they tend to think about scenes like this, a gigantic feedlot in uh, Colorado with thousands of cattle, uh, all emitting large quantities of methane, very potent greenhouse gas. But in fact, it doesn't help if we go back to this nice farm in New Jersey where the animals have good lives, um, but the cattle are still emitting methane. In fact, they're actually emitting more methane per kilogram of beef that they're producing because uh, it takes them longer to digest grass and in that digestion process they emit uh, more methane. So it doesn't help to say, I only buy my beef from organic farms uh, where the cattle are grass-fed. Um, if you're concerned about climate, it helps from an animal welfare point of view, but if you're concerned about climate change, it doesn't help at all. And as I say, it's really the poorest countries of the world that we are hurting here. And here's a quotation from the President of Uganda, who sees what we are doing to Africa as a kind of aggression. Because the, the countries in the north are not going to suffer in the, in the same way. Some, to some extent they might benefit. In Alaska and Siberia they may become places where you can grow more things. Um, but in Africa, which is generally already hot, where you have hundreds of millions of peasant farmers relying on uh, rainfall to grow their food. Uh, you get changes in climate, you'll get changes in rainfall patterns. Um, we could have uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of climate refugees around the world and where are they going to go? Um, so I think there's a serious question. This might sound like extreme language to refer to this as aggression, but I think there is a very serious question about what we are doing to some of the poorest countries of the world. Uh, and here's another problem that we're causing for some of them. Uh, Low-lying areas of India and Bangladesh um, where uh, warming causes rising sea levels where also uh, they're going to lose farmland, uh, often very fertile delta regions which are very densely farmed. Um, and I guess here in the Netherlands you know all about trying to keep the sea out, but um, you do have more resources to do it. Um, and no doubt we'll be able to do it more effectively even if sea levels rise than some of the world's poorest people. So, um, let me just close by summarizing what I've been saying because I, I do want us to have plenty of time for discussion. So this is what I think utilitarianism requires. Equal consideration for similar interests irrespective of species. Equal consideration for similar interests irrespective of race citizenship or distance. That's why we need to be considering the interests of some of the world's poorest people. And equal consideration for future generations, discounting only for uncertainty. So although we are already starting to affect some of the world's poorest people um, through climate change, and uh, many people who will be harmed by climate change are already alive, the worst consequences are probably going to come for people who are not yet born. But utilitarianism says, that's no reason for not giving weight to their interests. If we're not certain about the effects that we're having in the future, that's a reason for giving, for discounting it by probability. But merely because they don't exist yet, merely because they're future generations, even if they're not just our children or grandchildren, but uh, two or three centuries in the future, if we're damaging the planet for them, that also is something that we ought to give equal consideration to. So that's, those are the implications <coughs> of utilitarianism for these three particular crises that uh, we face as we enter the 21st century. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Singer, thank you for your beautiful lecture and uh, allow me to start with a question about Paul Evan and his beautiful uh, boat. Uh, as you are a utilitarian, uh, suppose that uh, because you 
show people this boat of Paul Allen and it strikes many audiences so much that they give away a lot of their money to good uh, organizations. Uh, in that case, you must be grateful to, to Paul Allen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that would be true. He's created a nice example for me to use. Um, but that doesn't mean I have to be grateful to him in the sense of um, thinking that he's done the right thing, right? Um, uh, he did not build that yacht in order to serve as an example of how not to live. Um, <laughs> so, you know, utilitarians make a distinction between uh, the objective benefits of, of, of actions, such as perhaps Paul Allen uh, having this yacht, and uh, whether we should praise or blame the agent, which depends on the agent's uh, own intentions. Um, so that's why I can still be critical of Paul Allen, even if he is, has created a useful example for me. Okay, let's talk about that intentions. I have a question about that also, because uh, in, in cases like real property and our favor of animals, you make an appeal to people. You have an audience and you make an appeal to people. And it's a appeal that often that I experience as sympathetic, but allow me to say that something seems missing. You hardly mention institutions, uh, political institutions. Um, and it strikes me because as a utilitarian, you are interested in the best results. And the best results are reached only when, we, uh, when many people say institutional reform is realized. And it is even said, suggested, that by giving money, we more or less confirm the bad situation in many political institutions. So why don't you talk more about institutional reform? I agree with you that uh, as a utilitarian, I would uh, very much like to see institutional change that would make a difference on a large scale. Um, and I have no objection to people talking about that. Um, one of my uh, good friends and, and philosophical colleagues, uh, Professor Thomas Poggi of Yale University, uh, talks uh, about changing the global economic order. And uh, uh, I'm happy that he does that. But it's something that's extremely difficult to do. Um, if I were you know, addressing an audience like this consisting of, of heads of government, um, then I would probably be talking about getting together to change the global economic order in ways that would help the poorest countries. But um, if I'm talking to people with very little power or influence over that, uh, I rather focus on things that you actually can do. Um, and since um, you are citizens of an affluent nation, since I assume that uh, all or virtually all of you have some spare income, and although students may not have a lot of spare income now, uh, you will probably in, in future have more, um, have an above average income because you'll have graduated from an excellent university. Uh, so um, I think you can make a significant difference in that way. Um, and you know, while I would certainly encourage you to be active citizens as well, to talk to your parliamentary representatives about trying to change the global economic order. Um, I think that uh, it's an extremely difficult thing to do and I don't have any real confidence that by talking about it I could have any kind of real impact. Yeah. And about the idea that clarity uh, only justifies uh, unjust uh, situations and unjust institutions? I just don't see any evidence of that really. I mean. Um, I think that uh, it, charity does make a difference, but I, you know, I mean, it, it's like some people say, you know, well, things should get worse. It's good that things get worse, you know. Um, I mean, the most tragic example of this uh, argument, incidentally, was put forward by <coughs> the communists in Germany in the 1920s and early 1930s. They thought that it, the rise of fascism was the last gas of capitalism and that uh, it was good that these more right-wing governments were taking hold because they were going to collapse and pave the way for communism. Well, we know what happened of course. Um, so I, I just 
I don't like theories that just sort of speculate that if only we wait for things to get worse, somehow something really good is happening. I don't think we have any confidence. And so we do what is in our power. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But about the justification of that kind of acts, uh, when you ask, when you, when you make this appeal to people, uh, you present all kinds of rational arguments and you suggest that people take an impartial viewpoint, equal consideration of interests. That is what you require from, from us. But usually, morality is developed and cultivated in particular environments. In family, in school, and in friendships, in concrete relationships with concrete people, we develop our moral sense. And uh, in, uh, in, in, now you are rather critical towards all kinds of family relationships and friends relationships. You say that they can, uh, in these relationships, people can attach themselves so much to people that they do not take that impartial stance anymore. And for instance, in bioethics, the way people care about their disabled children and so on, you, you say that an impartial viewpoint is more important and should be more stronger than that concrete family relationships. Uh, don't you ask him too much for people? Well, let me say a little bit more to explain my position, because I think it's a, a little more uh, nuanced than, than you suggested. Um, I'm certainly not against family relationships. I, I mean, I'm a, a father and a husband and grandfather even now, um, and I uh, love and care for my children and my wife and my, my grandchildren, and I spend uh, as much uh, time with them as I can. Um, and I admit that, you know, if uh, one of my grandchildren were drowning in, in the pond and uh, there was also the child of a stranger drowning in the pond, I would certainly rescue my grandchild in preference to uh, the child of, of strangers there. Um, so I think that um, we utilitarians recognize that humans are the way they are. We are mammals and we have very strong... Uh, bonds with uh, those who are close to us, with family in particular, and with small circles of close friends. And we would not try to destroy that or to say that it's a bad thing. I mean, I think that's something that simply really doesn't work. Um, I think the, take an example that's relatively benign but idealistic, uh, the pioneering uh, Israeli uh, kibbutzniks, the people who pioneered the collective settlements in Israel in the 1930s and also in the 1940s and 50s, tried really to do away with the family and have a collective settlement. And, and it really didn't work and they've generally uh, abandoned that and, and gone back to closer families. So that's the way we are. We have to accept that. But I do think that um, there are situations uh, in which we should not we should be more broadly concerned as well. And so, while certainly uh, you know, we're going to meet the, the needs of our children and our families and those we love before we meet the needs of strangers, when it comes to meeting the luxuries of our families, you know, I think we can perhaps say, look, there's a limit. Um, my child doesn't have to have the latest, most expensive um, uh, video game um, when there are other children who have nothing. So. Uh, the question is rather where we draw the bounds around this kind of relationship. Yeah. The question is also how do you develop moral sense? For instance, pet animals. In uh, your book you say uh, negative things about the pet animal industry because there is a lot of suffering. On the other hand, it is in the concrete relations with their pet animals that children develop a sense for animals. But according to your vocabulary of impartiality, the keeping of pets of children should be forbidden, but at the same time, that can be a source of developing the moral sense. Well, I've never said that the keeping of pets for children should be forbidden. And you say yeah. rather negative things about zoos, circuses, and pet animals. I say that's true. So I say negative things about zoos because most of them can find animals in ways that don't meet their needs. Um, I know that you have one of the best zoos in the world really close here in Arnhem. I've visited it some years ago. And um, 
So, you know, it's not necessarily true of every zoo that it doesn't provide the conditions in which animals can meet their, their, their basic needs, but um, still, most zoos uh, are really focused on how can humans have the best views of the animals rather than how can the animals have uh, good lives. Circuses also that use animals, particularly exotic animals, never provide them with decent uh, living conditions. And as far as the pet industry is concerned, you're right, I criticise the pet industry because it breeds all of these uh, animals so that people can have various breeds of dogs and have puppies and so on. But if people want to go to the local pound or shelter and adopt stray animals um, and, and are capable of being responsible pet owners and looking after them well and giving them the kind of life they need, uh, I've certainly never suggested that that's a bad thing to do. Um, but I think you were raising a broader question, which is how do we develop this sort of moral sense that utilitarians want? And, and it's a good question, but you know, remember utilitarians are focused on the consequences. So if the consequences of um, making it difficult or impossible for children to have pets was that um, they would not grow up with any bond to animals and they would be less sympathetic to other animals in their lives, then that in itself would be a reason for the utilitarian to say, uh, okay, well, we have to have a positive attitude towards children having animals that they live with, uh, as long as they can look after them well. And the same would be true about um, family relationships. If you say, well, children develop a moral sense within the family and develop moral character within the family, which I think is, is uh, true to a significant extent, then again, that's certainly something we want to encourage. Um, but there comes a point in children's moral development where they need to start to see that um, the world is bigger than their family and that their moral obligations extend far beyond their family. Uh, about uh, the pleasure and pain uh, debate, uh, you somewhere write that feeling pleasure or pain creates value in the universe. We can talk about value when pleasure and pain are at stake. But why? We can ask, why reduce suffering? As philosophers, we are used to meet to the, the, the sceptics that ask all, all kinds of critical questions. Why, why reduce suffering, Mr. Sceptic? Uh, uh, why should the suffering of other people, of animals, bother me? And this question I ask you because you talk rather critically about all sources of morality that uh, have something to say about suffering. Religion talks about suffering, but religion, for you, is not a legitimate source of morality. Uh, the idea of natural properties that human beings have is also often mobilized to, to condemn suffering, but it's not your line of uh, thinking. Uh, what many people would describe as human emotions, you are very critical towards human emotions. So what in the end is your ground where you are staying when you say we have to condemn suffering and we have to try to, to reduce it? I'm not, I'm not critical of human emotions as such. I mean, I think human emotions are vitally important. Um, emotions like uh, uh, sympathy, compassion, um, benevolence, uh, I think they are an uh, extremely important part of morality. What I'm critical of is the idea that we should base our morality only on our emotions. Um, because I think our emotions are often too limited. Uh, in the ways I've been saying. Um, we have an emotional response. The reason my example of the child drowning in the pond works so well is you, you imagine yourself seeing this small helpless child and you have an emotional response to that child. And that's a good thing. Um, but you don't have... If I tell you that there are 8 million children dying in the world from poverty-related causes, that doesn't produce an emotional response in the same way. It's a statistic. And it's too many for you really to grasp. And anyway, you can't see these children. So I think that shows that there's a problem with our emotions. Our emotions evolved because we lived in small face-to-face -face societies. And so we have emotion responses to the people we see. We don't have emotional responses to people we don't see because for most of our evolutionary history, we didn't even know about them. If we did, we couldn't help them. Um, but I think now we, we have this combination of reason and emotion. 
So we can, we can uh, use our reason to say, well, look, it would be wrong not to save this child here, but even though I don't have the same emotional response to a child who might be dying because they can't get um, uh, basic health care in Malawi, let's say, um, nevertheless, that child's life is just as important as this child's life. So that's an application of reason, and that's why I think we need to use reason to supplement, and in some cases to correct uh, the emotional responses that we have. So my criticism of emotions as a basic morality is only if you try to think that they give you the whole picture. And I think they only give you a part of the picture. Yeah, so in the end, the, the philosophical ground you are staying on is reason. Yes, in the so end. The, it, yeah. 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 Reason combined with also a very pragmatic way of looking at concrete situations and what's the best solution. That's right. Um, I think in the end, reason gets us to see certain things, uh, as I've been arguing, and I put up that slide right at the beginning, and that I think reasoning has a role in ethics, and I hope that my whole talk was a kind of um, uh, proof of that, a demonstration of the way in which we can reason in ethics. And uh, so we can reason on the basis of particular judgments, trying to reconcile different judgments, like you should save the child in the pond, um, therefore you should also save the child in Malawi, um, or another argument I used was, you think that it's wrong to discriminate against people because of their race or sex. You should also think that it's wrong to discriminate against them on the grounds of their species. Now, I did all this very briefly, we could talk a lot more about it, but that's, those are illustrations of the way in which I think our reasoning can move us to reach certain ethical conclusions. My final question is not my question. It's a question from the tradition that the Sutterbeck program has to ask the pre preceding lecturer in this series, the great thinkers, uh, to you, and then I will ask you to, to formulate the question for the, 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 the next uh, thinker. And uh, recently, our guest was Laura Lucien, and she had a very interesting question for you. Uh, she asks, you are a man of conviction, uh, I would like to ask you whether you consider that conviction to an idea is something that has helped or hindered humankind throughout history. Has conviction to an idea, I think about ideology, so, has it helped or didn't it help the world development? How would you imagine a world without conviction to any ideas? Well, I think the last part of that question helps you to answer um, the other part. Because at first, when I, read, uh, when I heard that question, I thought, how on earth are you going to balance the great things that have come through uh, the various positive convictions? I've talked about the utilitarian tradition, but of course, there are other ideas. You say, I don't deny that uh, religious teachings have led to some good things as well, some civilizing influences. And how do you balance that against the commitment to uh, racist ideas or to uh, totalitarian Stalinism or something like that. How on earth could you weigh those things up? But then you come to the end, what would a world, world without convictions or ideas be like? And it, it really is hard to imagine because um, we all have ideas, I think, about how to live and how to make the world better. And if we didn't have that, I think we would um, live in a way that would be unreflective. <coughs> we would be basically stuck in the same way of life that our ancestors were for um, <coughs> tens of thousands of years. Uh, and in fact, the fact that they progressed and did change shows that they had some ideas and that they had some convictions. And for all of the problems that the world has, I think that the world is a better place. That is, that it gives, uh, at least to humans, the question for animals is a bit different, but at least to humans, it gives us better lives for the majority of people than humans typically had if you go back, let's say, before people had ideas. Let's say you go back 20,000 years uh, into prehistory, um, before people really had moved on. I, th I think uh, there's evidence that we, we live longer, that we are less likely to die from violence at the hands of fellow humans, uh, and of course we have all sorts of freedoms and opportunities that they do not have. So, on the whole, I do think that a world without convictions would be the worst place.
Okay. Well, and then the question to you. Our next guest will be Saskia Sassen. It's South Dutch, but she is from the United States. She is professor of sociology at the Columbia University. Professor of sociology, what questions would you like to ask her? So, um, she's a professor of sociology. Uh, she's someone who's worked a great deal with uh, immigration, immigration patterns. And, of course, um, we have uh, a lot of controversial issues about immigration. Um, you have them here in Europe um, and in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, where I come from, in Australia, we also have um, a lot of questions because we have people who reach Australia uh, by boat and land on Australia's shore and claim uh, to be refugees and claim a right of asylum. I think somewhat similar things uh, happen here. So the question that I would like to ask her is, um, uh, there are also tens of thousands of refugees in the world who are living in refugee camps um, in often very poor conditions without much hope of getting out of those camps. Because although countries take some refugees, they don't take enough to remedy the, the, the number of people who are in refugee camps. And um, because, at least I know this is true of Australia, I don't know here, but because Australia um, admits a number of these asylum seekers who land on its shores, we take fewer refugees from the camps. So when we take people who land on our shores, we take fewer people from the refugee camps. Um, and uh, I wonder, this is based on uh, international law regarding uh, asylum seekers, but I wonder if the greater ability to move around the world and the greater ability to get the knowledge of conditions in different countries has made this uh, international law outmoded. So my question really for uh, Saskia Sassen is, um, should we continue to give more favourable treatment to people who are physically able to reach our shores in terms of giving them prior consideration of their refugee status and therefore allowing them to be admitted when they if they are able to show themselves to refugees, allowing them to be admitted ahead of people who are still in other countries in the developing world in refugee camps. Um, is that something that is a uh, fair and right way to do about something, or should we try to reform this situation and uh, produce a different outcome? I can imagine Saskia Sassen will dedicate her whole lecture to answer this. <laughs> we will all visit the director of, of Saskia, of course. Uh, audience, there are two people with micros walking around, and uh, there is one person with a red sweater. There was a gentleman here who wanted to ask a question before. I don't know if he's still there. Okay, well, we start with the red sweater and then we go to the other guest. Yes, please. I want to go to the child. And the man with the expensive shoes. Now there's a third man, and his name is Peter Singer. He's coming along. He asked the man, "Why don't you go into the water to save the child?" And the man with the shoes is saying, "Oh, sorry, I need my time for enjoying my shoes." Now, in his pocket, Peter Singer has a weapon, a gun. Is Peter Singer allowed to press the man to go into the water? And you will understand that I. Uh, make a reference to tax. Um, well, um, I guess one thing, one question would be, well, if I'm standing here anyway, wearing my cheap sneakers, why don't I go anywhere? Uh, I can't do that for some reason. And I know the singer can't swim. Oh, you don't have to swim. It's a shallow pond. I only have to get wet up to a bad day. Sorry. All right, I, I understand what you're trying to say. We philosophers always uh, invent the example. So, so for some reason, let's say I'm temporarily injured. I'm in a wheelchair. I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't save the child. Um, so yes, I suppose. I think if, if pulling out a gun would uh, coerce this man to saving the child, and the child would be saved, and that's the only way I can do it, I think I'm justified in doing that. Of course, if he knows. Uh, my moral views, he would probably also know that I'm never going to pull the trigger, so I'm only bluffing. <laughs> but uh, at least the threat, I think, is something I would justify. 
pulling the trigger, of course, is going to be useless. I'll have a dead person here and a dead child. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your words of anthropogenic interference. Could you please give us some uh, examples of this to make it more clear that this is, is a more chemical. Uh, uh, so examples of, of, of the greenhouse gases were Anth or anthropogenic or interference. What do you mean by this? I mean emitting uh, gases that warm the planet. So carbon dioxide, <coughs> methane, nitrous oxide. Um, that's that's what I mean. That's, that's what we. What, what the overwhelming consensus of, of scientists in the field tell us is that um, increasing the amount of these gases in the atmosphere has a warming effect on the climate of the planet. There was a question on the second row, so might you can immediately go down, go down again to my phone. Professor Singer, I have a question about animal rights. There are many kinds of animals. Dogs, sheep, snakes, uh, single cell organisms. Do you make any difference between different kinds of animals in your theory of animal rights? Yes, thank you. Certainly I, I, I do. Or you could say the theory itself makes the difference. So the, if you remember the principle I put up is equal consideration of interests. Um, now, uh, and I also put up that line of, of Bentham. The question is not can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? So I take, when I talk about interests, I'm, I'm talking about things like suffering or, or enjoying life. Um, there are many more interests than that, but all interests, I think, require a capacity to feel something. And uh, the sort of the, the bottom line, the, the, the most basic of these interests is the capacity to feel pain. So um, I don't think the single cell organisms, for instance, can feel pain. I just cannot imagine how without a complex, reasonably complex nervous system, an organism can feel pain. So there is nothing to consider there. You can talk about equal consideration of interests, but there are no interests there any more than there are for plants, I believe. Um, and even for some much more complex organisms, um, for instance, uh, I am doubtful. Well, yeah, insects, I think I'm, I'm doubtful whether they can feel pain. I'm not completely sure. Uh, I was going to say oysters, right? Um, uh, another reasonably simple kind of uh, mollusk that does not, I think, have sufficient nervous system to give us any real basis for saying with confidence that they can feel pain. So, so that's the minimal capacity. But and when we're talking about vertebrates, um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, they can, mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, you mentioned snakes, um, fish too, I think there is good evidence that they can feel pain. Um, within vertebrates it's more complicated, but maybe some of them can. Uh, an octopus, for example, seems to be a highly intelligent animal able to learn, uh, although it's an invertebrate, so probably it can feel pain, but uh, insects I'm not so sure about. It. <laughs> biology, biology can teach us more about it. So, yes. uh, well, certainly we learn more things about the uh, behavior and the nervous systems of animals, and yes, we should you know, keep a reasonably open mind. Um, more evidence could certainly change my views about some of these animals. There's a question over there. In fact, there are two questions. The guy with the black uh, sweater. The micro is coming to you. Uh, Mr. Singer, I have a little bit a uh, controversial question. Uh, a meat eater kills approximately 10,000 of animals in his life. Is it okay to kill a meat eater from a utilitarian uh, point of view? <laughs> They like, they like both of you. They like the idea. They're uh, such uh, fanatical um, animal rights supporters. That they think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, uh, I, firstly, I, uh, I, I put up again, uh, you know, much of this was very brief, but I, I put up a slide suggesting why I don't think that the death of a, a non human animal that's not really aware of its um, possibility of it existing in the future is 
equivalent to the death of a normal human being who does have those thoughts and plans about the future. So firstly, I, I wouldn't just weigh them one for one. Um, but secondly, um, I think that the animal movement is a, a movement that is trying to produce an ethical change in people's behavior. And I think it has to appeal to ethical arguments. And it clearly is going to undermine the basis of, of those ethical arguments and reduce its prospects of being taken in the way that it should be taken as an ethical movement if it uses violence, um, uh, if it uh, kills people or even if it um, you know, threatens to kill people as uh, has, has happened in terms of some uh, opponents of uh, the use of animals in experiments. Uh, I think that that is um, not a positive way to put forward the ethical stance uh, on which the animal movement is based. But still you are a consequentialist. I am still a consequentialist. I think that this is a the next kind of consequentialist argument that I'm putting forward yeah, as to why question. this is not the right way to behave. Just one reaction? I, if it's the last step towards animal liberation, is that allowed? Right, so it's a bit like Dostoevsky's example then suddenly. You yeah. just have to kill one meat eater and then animals will be spared. The billions of animals in factory farms yeah. will no longer suffer. Well, in that case, I suppose I would do it, yes. Already, <laughs> already okay, thank you. Already, a long time, there's someone over there waving with his hands almost all the time. Um, yeah. I actually have two questions, but I'll just, you can just which one. Which, one, which one you want to answer. Um, <laughs> my first question would be, uh, uh, 10 years ago you wrote One World. If you have to write it today, would you change anything about that book? Um, and my second question would be, uh, you hardly use the word greed in any of your presentations, or I don't see it often in any of your books. Is there a reason why you avoid the use of human greed, although it, it seems to be a big theme in your in most of your works. Uh, well, the short answer to that is that um, it's such a morally loaded word, um, and I think, in a way, I, I don't want to blame the individuals. I think that, to some extent, it's it's the, the culture that produces uh, individuals who think that the way to show that they succeeded in life is to buy two hundred million dollar yachts. Um, so I, I think if I'd said that Paul Allen is greedy, that would have been a, sort of, in a way, too heavy a, a term that I don't really want to use. Um, yes, there would be some things I would revise about One World. Um, uh, obviously, uh, some things have got worse. The, uh, I do talk about climate change there, but we've had let 10 years go by without significant progress in that area. Um, so that's one of the things I would revise. Um, I would perhaps say diff somewhat different things about, uh, there's a chapter about international law and um, inter humanitarian intervention, things of that sort. Um, I think that debate has advanced. I think we've seen some things that have been uh, uh, really bad happening. Um, but uh, we have made some cases where I think uh, we have responsibly interfered. So I supported the uh, intervention in Libya, for instance, uh, as a way of reducing uh, the number of innocent people who were likely to be killed by Gaddafi uh, if he was uh, not stopped. And uh, so I would have different examples and a different discussion of the role of international law in those cases. So that's just a couple of things that come off the top of my head. There probably would be others if I were to systematically go through the book. Before Sean, another? Yes, question? Uh, yes? <laughs> Uh, yeah, utilitarianism uh, relies very heavily on uh, cost-benefit analysis. Um, do you think that there are parts of human life that are uh, very profound to uh, to how we experience life and, and, and the luck we uh, the, the um, yeah the luck that we experience, um, but that are not suitable for cost-benefit analysis? And do you do you not think that that is a problem for utilitarianism? Well, I. I mean, there are certainly areas of human life that we don't really have any good method for um, weighing up or measuring the costs and benefits. Uh, that's true. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's, the, the method is not really applicable. I mean, I think 
the people who work on, on to try to assess uh, happiness and suffering and so on, and I think it's a, a useful thing to do. And there are some things that we can do a bit better than we used to be able to do, and there are some things that I think uh, people are uncomfortable about doing, but it's necessary to do. So, for instance, I, I'm not quite sure how you do it in the Netherlands, but, um, but in, in Britain, um, the National Health Service has a institute called the National Institute for Clinical Excellence that tries to uh, find out the costs of uh, saving life by the use of certain expensive drugs. And it uh, draws a line at a certain point and says, we do not recommend the use of these drug treatments where the cost of extending a person's life by one year in, uh, of normal quality is more than £30,000 uh, per year. So whatever that is in 45,000 uh, euros or something like that, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, uh, it's, I think it's, you know, you could argue about the particular figures, you could argue about whether more money should go into the National Health Service so that the, the line rises from £30,000 to £50,000. Um, but I don't think you can argue against the idea that somewhere you have to try and assess the costs and benefits of medical treatment and that there are some treatments that it is not worth providing. Because if you spend all your resources on extending one person's life for uh, one year, you won't have enough to do other more valuable things. So we're, we're, I think, getting somewhat better at doing some of these things than we used to be 20 or 30 years ago. And I hope that we'll continue to get better. But I do admit that at the moment there are some things that we can't really properly weigh up the cost and benefits. But that doesn't mean that um, utilitarianism is not the right way to decide questions. It just means that there are some areas where um, we don't have any precise method of reaching a good decision. But no other ethical view has any better hold of that, I think, either. Yes? Close. Yes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Singer. I've got uh, actually two questions, if it's possible. Uh, the first one would be um, utilitarianism. Uh, goes from the basis of objective moral values. So whether something is objectively wrong or something is objectively right. If the outcome therefore is also objectively wrong or objectively right, uh, that would mean that the outcome must be something that for everybody is the same. But for me, for example, the life of one child is the same value as the life of a hundred or a thousand. So how could the argument be that the life, the sacrifice in the life of one child for the lives of a thousand would be objectively good? For me, they would be even. Well, I think you're, I'm sorry, but I think you're just wrong about that. <laughs> okay. um, I don't think that it's true, and I, I think it's, it's, you know, people say that, and I know, uh, but I, I really find it hard to believe that if, um, you know, if you're faced with a choice between uh, saving one child and saving a thousand, and, and you know, you know, this is not your child, and it's, it's not that you know that it, it, there's anything particular about this child or, or those children, I, I really find it hard to understand uh, why you would not be influenced by the numbers. I mean, you think about the suffering of the child, or you think about the suffering of the parents who are bereaved. You know, isn't it worse when a thousand parents uh, are mourning the death of their child than, than one person, or the, uh, one set of parents are mourning it? I, I think it's fairly worse, and I think we should try to do what will minimize the amount of suffering that is going to occur. Doesn't the fact that we disagree about that, make the subject, make it subjective instead of objective. No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of disagreements um, about things uh, where we know that somebody is right and somebody is wrong, you know, various people. <laughs> it's obviously true, you know, I mean, there were disagreements, uh, let's say in 2003, was it, about whether Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, that doesn't mean that it was subjective. It doesn't mean that Bush's view was just as good as uh, those of the um, uh, people who said, well, maybe he doesn't have them. Um, it turned out that Bush was wrong. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that the fact that there's disagreement uh, shows that uh, there is no truth in the matter. Uh, 
in a practical ethics you write that just because there are disagreements, we are in need of an impartial point of view to solve those kinds of disagreements. Well, I think that that's true, but I mean, maybe the gentleman there thinks that his point of view is impartial. I, I don't know. We would, uh, so it may not resolve uh, that particular okay. Well, uh, uh, yeah, well, as there are many people, oh, yeah, but, sure. so uh, allow me to give some others. I, I'm going to uh, just intervene, by the way, say, are there no women in the audience? Or <laughs> I'm gonna, okay. <laughs> Mr. Singer, um, what is the um, uh, value of empathy? I mean, um, considering everything we logically think about, object, objective, subjective, um, is there a place for empathy? And if there is, is it, is it important? Do we need empathy uh, at all you know, to consider animal welfare and the consequences of climate change to people any, anywhere else in the world. How do you rate empathy? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think that empathy is extremely important. Um, I was talking about, I mentioned some emotions uh, before, um, and I didn't include empathy because I think empathy is actually, it's a special case, it's not exactly an emotion, it's a way of putting yourself inside another being and understanding <laughs> what that being is experiencing. Um, and then uh, if you do that and you have, then I think you may have an attitude of um, benevolence towards that animal uh, or human because you understand what they're experiencing and you would like to improve that. But, but I understand empathy as a slightly different from benevolence or sympathy too slightly different in that it's, it's rather a matter of putting yourself in the position of the other and appreciating what it's like. So to try to understand um, what other beings, whether human or non-human animals, are experiencing, empathy is a way in which we do this. Um, again, it's, it's, it's fallible. Um, we, we can supplement it with uh, some scientific studies in some cases. So, for instance, some people may think, looking at an animal in certain conditions, um, that it's uh, okay. Um, they don't see that it's suffering. But maybe we can see that it has very high uh, stress levels in its blood or maybe people who understand its behavior better can see that it doesn't behave like this when it's not stressed and vice versa you might think that an animal is unhappy and uh, it's not so uh, again it's 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 not an infallible method but it's a very important method in most cases um, where we don't really you know can't rely on science in our everyday lives we use empathy to try to understand what things are like for people and that should be the basis of on which we then give the equal consideration to their interests that I've talked about. Is there a second woman in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your action-driven lecture. Um, in your introduction to the uh, animal welfare crisis, uh, you mentioned some. Um, founding fathers of uh, theology and uh, philosophy and uh, um, quite bad um, uh, writing toward animals and um, I wonder to, to which extent in this highly uh, individualized um, society, um, uh, diverse society, are we still, um, our thinking is still uh, grounded in, in those ideas, and if so, do we need some kind of uh, cosmological revolution, or what's, what's the outcome? Um, okay, so I think these ideas are still influential, um, and it's, it's, it's not an accident, I think, that um, these ideas uh, were expressed in those periods and are still influential. Um, I think we often see that uh, ideologies serve interests as we perceive them. I mean, to some extent, this is uh, uh, Karl Marx's great insight, and I'm not a Marxist, but I think this is a, a bona fide uh, insight that the way in which you saw that uh, ideas can be influenced by um, economic uh, interests and more broadly the material needs that we are satisfying. So because humans have believed for most of their existence uh, that we uh, need to kill and eat animals and uh, even if we realize that we have alternatives people still are in the habit of doing that or like to do that so 
the ideologies that justify us in doing that um, are still influential and still prevail. Uh, so that's, I think, why they're still around. Um, what we need, I think, is a revolution in our ideas. I'm not sure about in our cosmology, though certainly as compared with Aristotle and Aquinas, yes, we have, we have changed our cosmology, and um, that's a good thing, um, and not just subjective either, I would say. Um, uh, so, um, what we really need here now is, uh, I, I think, a kind of uh, ethical revolution, um, that, uh, in which we really see that humans are not the only beings on this planet who have interests and who matter. And uh, that's the kind of change that we need to make. Clear. Final question goes to the man oh, yeah. with, with the glasses, <laughs> except the man with the glasses who has already made a long time. I almost came up with an answer myself, but um, <laughs> uh, I'd like to question one of your assumptions. Um, it's the one that says saving the child is good. So uh, this is going towards skepticism and nihilism. Um, so why not let the child die? Why is there any value in the life of the child? Um, and how do you escape this skepticism? Well. Um as I as I said at the beginning, I, I suppose the way I escape it is is because I think that uh, suffering is a bad thing, um, and uh, I think loss of happiness or enjoyment is a bad thing. So if the child dies, both of these things will occur. Uh, the child presumably has parents who will suffer through the loss of the child they love, um, and the child will miss out on the future happiness that the child is likely to have. Um, these are all assumptions, of course, but since you don't know anything about the child, you've never seen this child before, um, that's a reasonable assumption to make about a, a, a typical child that you see here in the Netherlands in danger of drowning. Um, so, of course, you could take the skepticism one step further. You could say, well, why do I think that suffering is bad, for instance? Um, and I suppose the short answer that I would give at that point is to say, uh, don't you find it bad when you suffer? Don't you try to avoid uh, your suffering? And if you do, then go back to the second or third slide I showed that morality is really trying to think what's the best thing to do, but in a way that is impartial. As again, uh, as Marcel said, that, that is impartial between different beings. So if I accept that it's bad for me to suffer uh, and I'm going to be impartial and I think I have to accept that for any other being that's suffering that's also a bad thing. Thank you. Thank you. That is a beautiful final remark. Mr. Sure. Singer, thank you. before we applaud, let me uh, officially say thank you. Uh, you have had a very exhaustive day. This morning you discussed with uh, our Dutch politician Marianne Thiele about animal rights. This afternoon we discussed with students from the university, and this evening you gave us the lecture and your beautiful answer to the questions. Thank you for all that. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, yes. such a stimulating audience with a good set of questions and I also want to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this program here at uh, the university for having invited me and put it on. Well, and now you can do something for us still. <laughs> Books are sold and you have said that you are willing to sign the article. I will do a few signatures before uh, we leave. Yes, okay, but thank you again Mr. Singh yeah. for everything you gave us. <laughs>